Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be here. Only several minutes late. There, Rosemary and Suzanne are now up here. We've been waiting on you for the last five minutes. So we can now we can now begin. Uh, so as many of you would know, we have our annual meeting today, uh, immediately following the service. There is going to be a light lunch provided. Um, but I think we'll start the meeting fairly soon uh, after the service. Uh, for those of you who have email, you would have saw that uh, I have a, my first wedding actually today at 3 p.m. here at the church. So it would be good if we were finished, certainly by that time. And I'm sure the bride and groom would appreciate that. Um, coldest night of the year, that's something that we've done for the last several years, as far as I know. And that's a walk that we do in late February. Uh, as a fundraiser, and we always raise funds towards Open Arms in Kenfield, and we'll be doing that again this year. The walk is February 25th, and um, I thought we'd do it at 10 a.m., and so that's on a Saturday, and that way we we have it, and then we have the rest of our day, and we'll do a two-kilometer walk. There'll be more about that. Uh, I'll send out some emails and things like that and send out the link where you can donate to our team. You can join our team. <laughs> Um, and typically what we've done the last couple of years is we gather at the church uh, either prior, well, prior and after, um, but maybe have a little hot chocolate or something like that. So that's coming up uh, at the end of February. And then the only other thing that I'll mention is that, uh, again, if you have email, you would have saw I sent out an email about starting up a sort of book club or uh, study. And what we're looking at is this book called... <clears throat> Uh, the Cost of Discipleship, and I think it will be a bit of a heavy read, but I think it will still be enjoyable for most of us, and so I'm looking to do this, uh, start this towards the end of February, maybe the beginning of March. The, the book itself is broken up into four sections, so we'll probably meet four times over four months, which I feel is quite reasonable for, for everyone who may have a busy schedule, gives us lots of time to get the reading done in between. So please uh, email me or call me, talk to me uh, prior to Wednesday. And uh, if you're interested in that, and then we'll order some books and hopefully they will be around, uh, you know, in enough time for us to start by March. With that, let me call us to... Uh, worship this morning and just invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us. Come those who are weary and come those who are filled with joy. Come those who are tired and disinterested. For the next hour, let the peace of Christ rest on you and lift you up. Let the mercy of God stir in your hearts and stir them towards praise and let the aid of the Holy Spirit renew your mind. So, dear Lord, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place where we have gathered in the name of Jesus. Dear Lord, we ask that you would search our hearts and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. Rid us of what is offensive within us and lead us in the way. Lord, in your way everlasting. Amen. We'd invite you to stand with us and sing Holy, Holy, Holy as our first song, and then Blessed Be Your Name. <laughs>
Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. At this time, I'll offer a quick prayer for the children, and then they can go downstairs. Although I see Jason coming. Jason, would you offer the prayer for the children? <laughs> Gotta be careful. <laughs> and uh, after Jason prays for the children, the children can head downstairs to Sunday school. I must have missed the updated memo. <laughs> You're doing the sermon today, too. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm winging it just like normal. Yeah. All right. Morning, church family. Let us bow our heads and join our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather here today to praise you, to worship you, and to thank you for everything that you do for us. Father God, we thank you for the children that are here, and we thank you for those that are unable to be here today. We ask that you look over them, that you bless them, that you grant them the grace and mercy that we all get by loving you. Father God, I just ask that during this time this morning that the kids are drawn closer to you, that they know you better, and that they come away with a stronger desire to walk in your path. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Children, you may now go down to Sunday school. I'll now ask Beth if she would come up and read our Old Testament scripture from the book of Deuteronomy. It's nice hearing those little voices. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 1 to 2 and verses 11 to 14. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to our forefathers, your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, you will build fine houses and settle down. And when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. On Tuesday evenings, several, uh, several of us gather for prayer, and uh, often we just take prayer requests at the beginning, and we chat, we talk, and then we lift up to God several of those items that we highlighted. And for last week, I'll just list a few things that we had been praying for. Uh, we've been praying for Rosemary, who, uh, who her health just hasn't been good. She's had some sort of cold or something, and just know, Rosemary, that we've been praying for you. And we prayed for you specifically last week. Um, we've prayed for a couple people who have come uh, to the church in the last few weeks, last month, uh, seeking some help, whether it be for oil or electricity or something else. Uh, we've been praying for Suzanne's mother-in-law, Margaret. We prayed for the annual general meeting that we're about to have. And um, we almost always pray for our families, particularly those who are not saved and those who may just not know the Lord, and we uh, we humbly ask God to be working in their lives and to embolden us to witness to them. And uh, finally, we prayed for some uh, new people that may have come around lately in the last little bit. So these are a few items that we can pray for this morning as well. And uh, certainly, if you're unable to make it to the Tuesday prayer, but you do have a prayer request or something that's just been on your mind. Just send me an email, call me, text me, however. Just let, let me know, 
and we'll, uh, we'll lift up you or that item in prayer. With those things in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, on this beautiful morning, we have gathered in your name, Lord. We have gathered seeking refuge in your house. We have gathered seeking comfort from one another. Lord, we have gathered seeking wisdom from your word. Father, we have gathered seeking strength from your spirit. Dear Lord, we ask that you would bless this time of worship this morning. Father, that you would bless our time in our meeting afterwards. God, we lift up to you this meeting. And Father, we do our best to recognize and to understand, Lord, that this is your meeting. That we are simply here to discuss what you would have us do, Lord. That we would discern together your will for this church, for this congregation, for this body of believers here in Berwick. Father, we ask that you help us to see all the resources, Lord, that you've blessed us with here to be yours, that they are yours for the furthering of the kingdom, God. Dear Father, we ask for unity at this meeting, and Lord, where there is disunity, we ask for grace and mercy to abound. Father, we're thankful for those who have prepared the food that we will eat, and Lord, we ask that it would be good for us. Uh, dear Lord, we think of our families this morning, those who are unsaved or maybe who have swayed away from the faith. And Lord, we lift them up to you. God, but we do ask that our prayers and our thoughts, our words, Lord, would lead us to action. An action emboldened by you that we may witness to our family members. Lord, that we may find the courage within us to just share what you have done for us. Lord, where we fail to have words, we ask that your Holy Spirit would give us words. Lord, we lift up to you those who are ill and sick, those who are among us here today, those who are joining online. Lord, we think of those who are unable to attend church anymore. Father, we ask that your Spirit would draw close to them, that they would be comforted. Father, that they would not be lonely or forgotten, but Father, that your people here would would be your hands and feet. Visit them, call them, send them cards. Lord, to literally just show their love for them. Father, in this regard, we do ask for a, a special portion of your Holy Spirit to fall upon us, that we may die to ourselves in this area, Lord, and prioritize the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Dear Lord, we lift up to you those who have needed our help at this church lately. And God, we're thankful that they have turned to you, Lord, for aid. We ask that you would bless them, that you would keep them. Father, that you would provide for them. Father, that you'd give them a sense of family, Lord, that they, they would have a sense of peace within you. And dear Lord, we do pray for those who have recently lost loved ones. God, as we read through the annual report and we look at the members who have passed just in this last year. And God, there are many names, which means many more names have been affected. <clears throat> Father, you are the God who draws near to the brokenhearted. And Lord, we, we take trust in that passage today. We take trust in your promises of that. So, Lord, be with us the rest of this morning. Lord, go before us. We pray, Lord, that all that is said and read and sung and spoken, Lord, would be glorifying unto you. God, that it would be edifying to us, that we would be lifted up, that our spirits would be refreshed. Lord, that as we look to you, we would find peace. We would find meaning and truth. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we're going to offer a uh, reflection piece be called Before the Throne of God. And it is one that you'll be familiar with, but we won't have the lyrics up on the screen. So we'll just uh, invite you to sit and reflect.
Michael Ford, and he will read our New Testament scripture coming from the Gospel of Matthew. Good 
morning. Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to, be, to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, draw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus answered to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. The dry feet of Jesus walking in the wilderness. So as we follow the footsteps of Jesus this morning, we find ourselves just west of the Jordan River, likely just beyond Jericho. Our terrain is harsh, rugged, dry, and threatening. The Judean wilderness is filled with steep mountainsides which plummet into narrow canyons. And a little rain means little vegetation, certainly nothing to feed a hungry man. Only the wild and the wolves and mountain lions find food in these lands. Uh, Wayne Stills, an author who I will continue to pull from for this sermon series, describes his experience in the wilderness in this way as he had traveled to this land. He says, I have walked in the wilderness where Satan tempted Christ, just west of where he was baptized. Good grief. What a place. This is the wilderness of Judea where God shaped the character of the future king in the valley of the shadow of death. Here David prayed, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Wayne goes on to say, David wasn't kidding. Endless piles of rock, steep hills, no trees, meager vegetation, little water, slight shade in lizards. As far as his eyes could see, it was empty, dry, and depressing. Wayne says, I tried to imagine the solitude and struggle Jesus would have endured here for over a month, but I could not. Now, as you can see, the landscape before us is not dissimilar to the one which Israel spent 40 years wandering. Just as the Lord then in the time of Moses led Israel into the wilderness for 40 years, so does the Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness. The NRSV translates Mark's narration of this uh, Spirit's leading in such a way. It says, and the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And if we look at the Greek used in the Gospel of Luke, the word used means to literally be thrown out or thrust out. And so we have here the Spirit sends Jesus, leads Jesus, and immediately uh, compels Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And if we were a Jew living in roughly 80 AD, reading this for the first time, I think we may wonder, does Jesus withhold from the devil's temptations? Or does he fail like Israel has time and time again before him? The account of Jesus's baptism, which we looked at last week, taught us that Jesus is the Christ. God's own voice descends from heaven along with the Holy Spirit. And in an in inauguration, Jesus is set apart, made known to be the very Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah. Therefore, the question is no longer whether Jesus is the Messiah for the reader or for us, 
but what kind of Messiah is he? You see, this is not the first time that God uses the wilderness to test and to humble. As Beth had read for us earlier this morning, Moses spoke these words in Deuteronomy. He calls out to Israel to remember the long way that the Lord your God had led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger. But as we know, Israel was never able to pass the tests given. The law of God, as we know, is too demanding. It requires faith. It requires obedience. It requires justice, compassion, love. It requires sinlessness. And Israel's history, starting right from Adam and Eve, had always been a rough, backsliding, sinful existence. We see in our scripture today, as would the original author and reader, that Christ is fulfilling what Israel could not. Even in the midst of weakness, in the midst of dehydration, starvation, in the midst of being faced with the temptations of Satan, Jesus remains faithful, obedient, and reliant upon his Father. We see today that Jesus is our substitute. The suffering servant of Isaiah, the son of David, walking through the valley, who then goes on to march up to the gates of heaven, the great city, and cry, open up, lift up your head, O gates. Jesus' temptation illustrates a critical aspect of Jesus' saving mission. In a real time and place, he comes to do what mortals like us cannot do on our own. We need a substitute, and we have one in Jesus. This fact strikes me in particular, where the gospel writers highlight again that in a specific place and time, such a tangible example, Jesus comes to do what we cannot do. And we have that uh, typology when we look back to Israel wandering the desert for 40 years, constantly complaining, constantly looking to idols and the rest. But nonetheless, we see Jesus here genuinely, literally doing what we cannot do. And that is just a glimpse of what he has done for us. So as the slanderer, the tempter, the evil one, as Satan takes his swings at Jesus in these three temptations, we quickly learn how Jesus had spent his time in Nazareth prior to the baptism. He had been in the word. For each temptation that this accuser tossed, the carpenter responded with scripture. To be sure, Jesus had spent 30 years with a hammer in one hand and the scriptures in the other. 30 years of preparation for three years of ministry. As Satan tried and tried, Jesus did not need to look for a concordance. He did not need to take time to refresh his mind with a verse but he had the word readily available in his heart. As one scholar says, Jesus had become a son of the law, a bar mitzvah in the most truest sense. Jesus spent 30 years preparing for three years of ministry. And I stumble on that reality to think that I lived for 25 years, spent three years in seminary, had only been a Christian for several years, and here I am in ministry. And I think if, if Jesus took 30 years in preparation, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for us? If we start to question why we're not fulfilling what we think we should in our Christian walk, if we wonder why we can't pray, if we wonder why we can't be in the word, if we wonder why we can't seem to die to ourselves and live for Christ. Just consider for a moment, how much time and preparation have you spent? If you wonder why we can't be a part of feeding the hungry and housing the homeless, how much time have we spent in preparation for ministry? With the first temptation, we see that the evil one uses old tactics. 
He had faltered the faith of Israel years before in this wilderness by using their hunger to question God's provision and faithfulness. And he hopes it will have the same effect on Jesus. Further, he asks of Jesus essentially to use his divine power to both satisfy his personal needs rather than wait for God to meet them. But he also does this to curb his spiritual practice of fasting. You see, now there are two sort of perspectives that we can take or two um, positions we can take on what the fasting of Jesus means, what it represents, what its end goal is. Because in some of the Gospels, it says that Jesus went out to the wilderness and fasted to be tempted. And some of the Gospels highlight that it was after the 40 days of fasting that Jesus was tempted, that he fasted in preparation for it. And perhaps both are true. But what I do see or believe I see here is the reality that Satan uses those things which bring us close to God against us. Perhaps one of the best approaches the devil takes is to cause us to drift off God's path just ever so slightly. It is in our spiritual practices that the very nature of temptation arises. I consider uh, fasting and the desire to eat. And if we fast in such a way as to practice denying ourselves so that we may rely on God, it is in that fasting that we have the temptation to do the exact opposite, to eat. Have you ever noticed, as I have, that it is most difficult often to read scripture when we need it? That prayer eludes us when our spirit thirsts for the Lord. It is these times when we find ourselves in situations where we need God that temptation arises. Finally, in this, in this first temptation, we see that while Jesus was physically uh, he was empty. Spiritually, he was full. When we look at the temptation of the temple, what I will highlight is that for Luke, this temptation comes at the end, while in Matthew and Mark, um, or in Matthew rather, it is the second temptation. Luke highlights this temple temptation as the climax, and that's because of Luke's uh, interest and focus on the cultic temple of Israel. But nonetheless, we see a very bold move made by Satan. As Jesus has gone out into the wilderness to confront him, Satan leads him right back to not just the holy city, but to the most holy place. This is the place where God said, I will reside with my people. And this is exactly where Satan brings him. He brings him up to the top and says, throw yourself down. And he misquotes scripture, saying that you will be lifted up from the wings of angels. But we know that the Heavenly Father is not about to let Jesus fall to his death, and particularly not on his own house. And the devil knows this and urges Jesus to be careless. He can afford that here, particularly given what this moment could mean for him. For Jesus, if he steps off this ledge of the temple at the pinnacle, at the very height of it, if he jumps off this temple, he steps off the edge and he floats gently to the earth before the eyes of those gathered in the markets and courts below, just consider what would happen to his political figure. It would be guaranteed. His political future would be guaranteed. All it would take is a little presumption on Jesus' part, a little carelessness, and he would sidestep the cross, and he would have it all. One commentator highlights that this is a very similar thing that takes place. Again, the devil, while being cunning, often tries to use the same tactics. And this is what's brilliant with this, as we see Jesus substitutes for us and does what we were unable to. In the wilderness, the devil was not able to get him with hunger. 
And on this temple, he was not able to get him with carelessness. But if we look at Jeremiah 7, 1 to 11, this recounts what did take place where the devil succeeded. Jeremiah 7, 1 to 11 reads this. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord God's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who have come through the gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widows, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe. Safe to all these detestable things? Has the house, has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. We see in this passage that Israel had become careless with the holiness of God, with the holiness of the temple, with the sacredness. God calls out to them and says, do not stand in this temple saying, this is the temple of the Lord. We are safe. It does not matter what we do or how we act or who we are, who we worship, but this is the house of the Lord. We are safe. The carelessness given to the temple succeeded for Satan in those days. And here again, he brings Jesus to this temple to do the same. Yet again, Jesus responds with scripture, saying, you will not put the Lord God to the test. The Mount of Temptation, which is pictured here, is a hill in the desert where the devil is believed to have tempted Jesus. Really, the exact location is unknown and impossible to determine, but tradition does place this event at Mount Korantani, or Korantal, a hill approximately 1,200 feet high, and it's located about seven miles northwest of Jericho, near the road from Jerusalem to that town. Now, this place was not traveled, really, by major trade routes due to the amicable terrain. And this is the kind of countryside envisioned by the evangelists when they do describe the temptation of Jesus. I imagine that when Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth, what flashed before them was not just the cities and nations of the ancient Near East, but rather all the kingdoms that ever were and ever will be. The temptation, I believe, was not just the to be the king of Rome or Israel or Samaria or the Han Dynasty in China or the Indic nations, but the temptation given that day on the top of that mountain was to be the king of all the empires that had been and are to come. Think of the Mongol Empire, the Ottoman, the British, the Spanish empires, the Aztecs, Egypt, America, and so much more. Jesus could have had it all. Jesus was offered a fast track to being king of the greats, king of the best, king of the kings. But instead, he chose the path laid out before him by his father, a path of pain and substitution, a path that would lead him to be king of the lowly, the unwanted, the outcast, king of the sinner, king of us. He chose the path that led to pain and suffering, that he may die for us that he may welcome us together to gather, those of us who are unworthy, for we all fall short of the glory of God. There's not one of us here 
that is better than the other, not one. And this is what Jesus chose to do. Now, if we step back and, and take a look just generally at these temptations, Jesus' first actions were to overcome these temptations from Satan, something that Adam, as well as Israel, had failed to do. So these temptations really show that Jesus is anointed by God, and he represents humanity and being faithful to God. God's promises come in through a man who is able to deliver what God offers and who can deal with sin by being faithful and obedient to God. What is also interesting to note here, and one, one uh, author that I read mentioned this, he said this, the devil challenges us as well to repent, to change our minds from accepting God's word. For we know that repent just means to change one's mind, which then leads to a change in action. Adam's failure and Christ's success swung on this same hinge, on a response to God's word. The setting of one's mind, regardless of the truthfulness and faithfulness of God and his promises. And this is where we do see Jesus so tangibly succeed, where Adam failed, where Israel failed, and certainly where we fail, is that his response to God's word was affirmative. Again, a man who spends 30 years for three years of ministry is certainly taking God's word to heart. The gospel writers do well to highlight, again, the reality that Jesus is the substitute for sinners. They show that where Israel failed, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, faithless and sinful, Jesus is able to withstand the temptation of the slanderer. And they show so very clearly that this is in part due to the word of God written on his heart. As we consider how we respond to God's word, whether we've whether we read it, whether we don't, whether we trust it, whether we don't, we can consider Psalm 119.105, which says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I've often felt, even in my Christian walk, that I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I should be doing, where I should be going, how I should be going there. And yet the response, the answer is so simple. God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's his word. That is where we find our way in life. It is in God's word. I think of it, how many times have we walked on a, uh, I don't know, through the forest or a field in the, in the midst of night and it's dark and there's a path. We just can't quite see it. And we are able to hold up a flashlight or for the younger ones here, a cell phone maybe, and we find the path. And all of a sudden we go from not being able to see where we're going to seeing the path. It's just, it's that, what else can you say? It's just that clear. That light in our hand is the word of God. Are you tired of not knowing where you're going? Read scripture. Finally, what we do see in the temptations is uh, it's really, it's um, paraphrased, I suppose, or laid out for us in Hebrews 4, verse 15. Paul says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And that is really, I think, something that is most meaningful for us this morning. Is again, if we look back to how these temptations show that Jesus literally does what we cannot do. Just in that way, he has been tempted like us. He knows the struggles we have. If you think you have an anxious thought in your head that is foreign to God, you are mistaken. If you think you have an issue in life that causes you to stumble and you just wonder, how will I ever overcome this? How could God ever work in this context, in this situation, in my family life, in my work life? You are mistaken to question that. Jesus became 
Well, he took on flesh. He became incarnate, that he would live a life as we live, that he may empathize with us, that he may be our substitute. As we just fall back into that first temptation for a moment, when Jesus is traveling in the wilderness and he's hungry, he's probably quite thirsty. He's been alone all this time. We see that the Heavenly Father basically asks Jesus and had asked Israel this question. Will you trust me even when the fundamentals for survival are not in view? And obviously that question is not a direct quotation from scripture, but it lives, I believe, in both of these stories. The Lord had brought the Israelites into the wilderness to humble them, to test them, and to teach them, yet they had failed. But this is here where Jesus succeeded. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for just the, uh, the narratives of your time spent on earth here. God, we ask that uh, you would embolden us to read your word. Lord, that you would embolden us to seek you out. Lord, to chase after you. Lord, your word says, search and you will find. So God, just help us search. Help us seek you out. Lord, we ask that your spirit would guide us. Lord, that your word would be a light unto our paths. God, again, we thank you for your word this morning. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us and sing our final piece, Standing on the Promises of God. And if you want to, if you want to use your hymn books that are there, it's number 175. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Standing on
us in prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Lord, God, we thank you very much for your gathered worship service here today. God, we ask that you would go with us as we leave this place, Lord, as we head downstairs. God, we ask that your spirit would guide us, Lord, that your word would be a light unto our path. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And as we do leave, that's right, I've got a benediction here somewhere. Uh, as we do leave, for those who are joining us, certainly please come downstairs and enjoy the meal. Um, I may be corrected, but, oh, uh, oh, I'll say grace, yes, I'll say grace, yes. Um, what was I going to say? I was going to say that I may be corrected, um, but I don't think there's an issue if you stay, if you, if you want to see what takes place at our meeting, stay. We're going to start the meeting during lunch so eat stay as long as you want or or go home but anyway if you're <laughs> if you're visiting you're invited <laughs> and here is our benediction as we go from this place go now in peace and never be afraid for god will go with you each hour of every day go now in faith steadfast strong and true and know he will guide you in all you do go now in love and show you believe Take heart and reach out to others so that all the world can see. Amen. Mm -hmm.